so much, um, Antoine, for um, that introduction. I'm very glad to be able to be here, not only in the context of um, the talks that have been going on every month um, over since, uh, since October in the series of the architecture of the mass, but to be able to present my own thoughts on one aspect of the architecture of the mass. So there are two talks, uh, this one and next month, which are both dealing with the physical architecture from, of the mass. And, and next month, um, in March, Father Peter Newby is going to be talking. And he was an architect, um, a practicing architect before he became a priest. So he's going to have some very interesting insights for us. And so I thought that I would concentrate my talk on the sacred space within a church, um, what defines uh, that sacredness, uh, what it might mean, and look at some examples of, um, of, of different types of uh, reaching towards the sacred in architecture. Um, I'm going to be looking at some examples from uh, contemporary architecture and also from earliest times. I've drawn quite a lot on reading um, the work of two, I think, great um, German scholars who have written on this notion of sacredness. One of them, um, I'm honoured to say, is a trustee of Benedictus, Father Michael Lack, <coughs> who's a parish priest of the London Oratory. Father Michael is not able to be here this evening because he's doing other things. But he has published um, quite a lot, and recently, Signs of the Holy One, um, published by Ignatius Press last year, which is a really wonderful um, uh, survey of the idea of the sacred across um, music, art, um, architecture, and obviously primarily literary. Uh, liturgy, and uh, Father Michael is uh, primarily a church historian, so he has great insight. And then a book that was published some years um, earlier, some years ago, called The Heresy of Formlessness by a German scholar called Martin Moserbach. And I've been looking at those books and I've learnt a lot from them, and so I'm going to be quoting a little bit from um, Father Michael and from Martin Moserbach. <coughs> okay, so the, I'm showing here. Um, a picture called The Miracle of the Mass at Bolsena by Raphael, and it's a, a fresco in the Stanza di Eliodoro in the Vatican. So with this, I'm introducing the idea of the, <coughs> the key locus of the sacred in terms of the Catholic Church, and that is the uh, conse uh, consecration of the host at the altar by the priest. And um, some of the pictures I'm going to show are these miraculous consecrations. So in the 13th century, there was a priest who doubted the veracity of the um, transubstantiation at the moment of consecration. And a miracle took place because of his doubt. And um, this picture illustrates that. It also is an extraordinary anachronistic image because we have kneeling on the other side of the altar, um, as it were, facing the, the priest, the doubting priest, who then has his faith affirmed by the miracle of the bleeding host, is the uh, Pope Julius II who commissioned the work from Raphael. So we have that kind of um, that anachronistic moment of the, the presence of the Pope at the miracle, but we also have the whole image of the miracle being taken out of time, placed in this otherworldly space which exists, which as believing Catholics, many of us will know, is this timelessness moment of the consecration, this moment of sacrifice, which is constantly repeated but always the same, exists in time and space in real body, real blood, but yet is somehow completely other and inaccessible. So the idea of the sacred space is something that can contain this mystery. And so architects have responded, art and artists have responded to this uh, necessity for containment in different ways. And you can see that here, for example, um, Raphael is, has created, we have no idea what the church was like at Bolsena, where this miracle took place. Um, but he's created a little wall behind the altar from which people can peer over <coughs> and witness. And so this is a very important aspect, and we'll be coming back again and again to this um, point of um, the separateness of that miraculous moment, whether it be the miracle of the 
the bleeding host for a doubting priest, or whether it be, as it were, the everyday miracle of, of, um, of what uh, happens at consecration of, of the bread and wine. Um, and that separateness has to be enhanced in some way. So here we have this beautiful containing wall. So Father Lang has written that um, the theological foundations of church architecture, when God appeared to Solomon after building the temple, he declared, I have consecrated this house which you have built, and I have put my name, therefore ever my eyes and my heart will be there for all time. That's the presence of the transcendent God in the Holy of Holies of the temple, and it became the focus of Jewish prayer. The idea of a quasi-physical dwelling place was already questioned by Solomon, but will indeed God dwell upon the earth? And so this is the, this is the question that this, sac this artistry of the sacred space has to deal with. Is it possible that God could actually be on earth? And so forth into the New Testament. And with this sacrament, God dwells within us. So this picture, I'm going to move the chair. This picture, um, which I found on the internet, this magnificent image, um, shows us that any space can be made sacred. Any tent can become a sanctuary. Um, note that in the image, um, apparently a famous priest, I, I, don't, I didn't take down um, a note of his name, of um, in charge, the chaplain, 69th New York Regiment in the Civil War in the United States, um, insisted on perfect vestments, uh, even though he was celebrating mass on the battlefield. So this shows that no matter where, and no matter the context, architectural or, or physical context, this idea of sacredness can be maintained, can be built, can be can be constructed. So it, if it's not made of bricks and mortar, what is it that makes something sacred, uh, a space sacred? So that's kind of what I would like to explore a little bit. So here, um, it's a very, very tiny, <coughs> very, um, very uncomfortable place to sit, uh, which is a tiny little chapel. It isn't really a chapel, it's the ante room to a room where St. Francis lived at the beginning of his monastic life in Cortona in Italy, um, not very far from Assisi. And he, he, he made a, a little kind of convent, a gathering of monks there, um, eight people living in tiny little stone places in a valley far from the town. And the room that you can see through the right-hand side of that little opening, there's a tiny room there with a stone bed, sort of stone shelf, and that's where he slept. And this is where he celebrated Mass. So I've been to this place many times. And then, I mean, you have to take it from me unless you've been there yourself. But perhaps you've been to places that are similar, <coughs> where it's a place that's always full of visitors. People love to go there. It's very, very beautiful. There's a ravine outside in the woods, and people go for walks. And, and it's a pilgrimage place, of course. So St. Francis, you know, right in the middle of Italy, patron saint of Italy, and so forth. Hundreds of people come. And the minute they get to the edge of this little space, they go silent, whether they want to be. You know, no offense to Italians who might be here, but Italians <laughs> love to talk. And everybody goes silent. And you sit in there, and you hear the mosquitoes buzzing, and you can't hear any other sound. There's something about that tiny little space that is enormously sacred. And of course you have in your mind, you know, St. Francis lived here, he also came back here, he didn't die here, but he came back here when he was very, very ill. And he lost his sight and he was lying in the room behind. So you have that, you know, if you've got a devotion to St. Francis, interested in, in the way that he, let's say, tried to reform the church and then the other things that he did. There's something, there's something uh, difficult to define about the sacredness of this space. And so I put it in there as a kind of, well, you know, it's like the tent in the field in many ways. It's, it's a very rough place, but the sanctity of it is tangible. It, it comes down the centuries to those who visit it. There's no beauty in it. And I'm reminded of, in Isaiah, you know, this line that we hear often, particularly during Lent, 
you know, there was no beauty in him and no comeliness. So the idea that, again, it's, we celebrate Christ and his presence with beauty, but often there is no beauty, and yet he's still there. So this extraordinary church of San Clemente, it, it gives us some access into the various different uh, stages of development of what we have in the Christian church. And I quote from Father Lang again. The Christian liturgy assigns to the people a much more important role than pagan worship did, because the people in that did not participate in the offering. This fundamental antithesis is manifest in different conceptions of sacred architecture. The classical temple has an extrovert, extroverted character. So the classical temples, as we've all seen them um, in ruins, the decorations are on the outside of the columns, sculpted friezes, and so forth. However, the Christians, as soon as they were able to develop a monumental architecture, adopted the form of the basilica, which was the meeting hall of ancient Rome. And the basilica then provided a large interior space where everybody could gather because Christians wanted to be together to celebrate and the sacredness developed within the building. And therefore, decoration happened, on, generally speaking, on the inside. Now, with San Clemente, I don't know if anybody knows it, but you have uh, three layers, one on top of another. You have a second century Mithraeum, so it was one of the cults that were growing up towards the end of the Roman Empire where um, the cult of Mithras, and the Mithraeum is, is low down with a, an altar of this pagan ritual um, and space for people to gather. Then there's a fourth century basilica over the house, the Domus of Clement, and then here what we see now on the, as it were, ground level <coughs> is the 12th century basilica. So we can see that the, um, the Christian church adopting um, ancient forms, um, adopting places, specifically places where people had uh, lived and those people who dedicated their lives to Christ became Christians, welcomed others, and therefore a community grew around it. And the church itself defines that home, as it were, the home for the sacrifice to take place, as it were, borrowing again from the past. So we can see some of the some of the elements that we find often in Roman churches, um, particularly defining the central sacred part, which is a low wall around the um, where the high altar is and where the gospel and epistle are read. And here's another example of it: another early early uh, church of the ninth century in Rome, um, Santa Sabina. Another titular church, that means it has the name of the person who, um, <coughs> who had the house that was there, and her name is Sabina, and she became a Christian. And it turned into a very large monastery, eventually a Dominican monastery. Um, St. Dominic lived there, St. Thomas Aquinas lived there. Now, this church was um, redecorated on the inside in the 16th century by Domenico Fantano, who was one of the architects who wrote for the Pope St. Peter's. Um, in the 20th century, an Italian architect called Antonio Munoz did um, a lot of taking away of everything. So what you're seeing here is an early 20th century conception of what an early Christian interior design should be. And it's quite contentious, there's a lot of different aspects to it which make people feel a bit uneasy. But what it does do is gives us a little bit of insight into 20th century, um, 20th century concerns related to what means sacred. So he took away all of the Baroque fittings, all of the things we might be familiar with with the church like the oratory here um, next to us with uh, statues with gilds and so forth with paintings. All of this was taken away and it was brought back, quote unquote, back to the simplicity of what the architect judged had been the uh, place before. So there's obviously somewhere in the, all of these swirling ideas of what makes a sacred space, there's this idea of simplicity and this idea that we saw initially um, with the cell of St. Francis. So, quoting again from Father Michael's book, he, he puts together four conditions for sacred architecture. Some of them are not, not going to concern me specifically, but I'll mention them. Verticality, 
unless a church has verticality, then it cannot reflect the, the soul striving to God. So we're going to see some examples where there is no verticality at all, and the feeling then of um, dis sort of unease and, and um, perhaps disruption of um, the, the sacred moment is, is augmented by this horizontality, this lack of verticality. Orientation. And um, Father Michael Lang has written extensively on this aspect of orientation. Which way should the church face? What sort of space are we, when we come in, where do we go? What are we looking at? Where does our eye take us? This is, again, a very important point. And in terms of architecture of the sacred space, I like to think of you know, the square outside the church, or the narthex, for example. Narthex being a kind of preparatory space um, in early Christian churches outside San Clemente, which the church I just showed you. And then people gather there, then they move into the church. And then as they go up the church, they get closer and closer to that <coughs> area where the low wall is. And that is where, as it were, the magic happens. That is where the miracles take place. So this idea of orientation is very important. The third of his categories is the threshold. And that is, obviously, the boundary between this world and the other world. This is the thing that I'm mostly going to be concerned with in this talk. The entrance to the building, the, the concept of liminality. To enter into the house of God, we must cross the threshold. This symbolizes passing from the world wounded by sin to the world of new life to which all men are called. So that's from the Catechism. So, you know, we can see this example if those of you who know Rome with the, with the magnificent um, Piazza of Bernini outside, so there you are, you're kind of embraced by the arms of that, you're welcomed into the church, and so forth. And then there's the fourth principle that um, Father Michael mentions here in his book, which is the connection between sacred art and architecture, specifically in relation to the image of the human person. Because the Christian religion <coughs> is an incarnational faith, the essential um, inclusion of representational art is at the, at the center of the relationship between the man and woman who goes into the church and what they see when they're, when they're there. But I'm not going to be talking so much now about <coughs> visual art and representation of, of, of the human person in, in sacred art, but more, as I say, about this idea of thresholds, liminality, limitations, boundaries, what makes things sacred. So, this is a very special sacred spot, and you can see a priest there saying Mass. I had the privilege of going to Mass here, and Father Rupert of the Oratory, and a couple of other people, and we went on the feast day, one of the feast days of St. Edward, um, and a Mass was said. So this is the tomb of St. Edward the Confessor, a very particular space, uh, where people, the pilgrims are invited to participate in the sacredness. Now, it is also where Mass is said, but here it's almost as if the role, the miracle of, of the Mass, the consecration, the sacred moment, is, um, is made enhanced, made more sacred, more special by, by the fact that the altar is attached, I'm actually part of this stone and this marble block, which is decorated beautifully, as you can see, with cosmotext, mosaics, and it Italian work. Um, the, the tomb of the saint, and all the pilgrims came for it. And you can just see to the right hand side of the shoulder of the man who's serving the mass, you can see a sort of dark space. That's one of, I think, six recesses in that little block where pilgrims go and you kneel down. I mean, I've done it myself, it's the coolest thing. You kneel down and you're kind of sheltered inside this tomb, but you're not in the tomb, obviously, but you can touch with your hand the wall of the tomb there. So it's kind of giving us privileged access to the sacredness of that tomb. And therefore, to participate in Mass at the shrine, this would have been, this is not obviously, these are only special occasions that can be done now, but this would have been when the church was in its height as a pilgrimage centre, this would have been the, the aim and the focus of all pilgrims who came to pray, to pray at the shrine of St. Edward. This kind of getting closer and closer, and then finally being included, as it were, wrapped around by the sacredness of the object. So this 
tomb itself was created in order to kind of include us. Makes us feel quite sort of special. And again, in Westminster Abbey, we have in front of the high altar, so if you can imagine where that green altar frontal is, which is the 19th century uh, Gothic revival by George Gilbert Scott, the altar and the mirror doss behind it. So through that door on the either side behind is that little tomb that I'm showing, the tomb chapel, the shrine. In front of this um, high altar of Westminster Abbey, is this most magnificent? Well, there's no other way of describing it except like a carpet, but a carpet made of marble, a cosmetesque pavement laid out um, on the orders of Henry III uh, by Italian artists who came to England. This is normally covered up, nobody can see it when you're in Western Australia. Every now and again it's uncovered. It's obviously extraordinarily precious, you can't walk on it, um, but in the in the old days, also, you couldn't walk in it. It would be the monks and those in choir and the clerics of the, of the Abbey who would have access to that space. So the fact is, if you can imagine you coming in as a pilgrim to Westminster Abbey, you're seeing this magnificent extent of building in front of you. And then as you get closer and closer, you might have glimpses through the screen of this glittering ground in front of the altar, and then behind that ground is the tomb of the saint who you hope is going to um, pray for you and intercede for you and so on. So it's, it's a, a sense an architectural drama is being enacted for, your, for you so that you can participate more fully in the approach to the sacred. Um, obviously not many churches have such a magnificent um, approach to the high altar. Um, this is something that was particularly special, and many scholars have done a large amount of work on the, um, the meaning of it. It's all to do with the end of time, it's to do with redemption and so forth. And there's, a, there's a lot of texts and so, so on woven into the design. So a different sort of separation can be seen in this church. Um, it's a monastery in, um, in Florence called San Mignato. So we have the separation of function and access. The, um, it's sort of in the side of the hill. And the monastery buildings are kind of behind and to the side. And so the monks it didn't even have to come down to the ground level. They could go <coughs> straight onto the upper level where you see the pulpit um, there and the ambo for reading the epistle. These are, are two different purposes, these sort of reading. Um, reading areas, um, and all made in marble and beautifully carved and so forth. So that's a kind of private space up there for the monks. So they would then chant the office, and then downstairs would come the people, us, in order to participate. But we couldn't access that space, it's set up very high. So that's, again, you know, it's on a hill, so even approaching it, you see it from all over Florence, actually. And you think, right, I must go there. And you walk and you walk and you get there. And then when you're in there, still you have further to go. So this idea of verticality is being enhanced by every aspect of the, the architecture. And then this beautiful high altar, it's a bit bleached out there, you can't quite see, um, by Michelozzo from 1448. This is again inside a small enclosure. So here we have plenty of boundaries. All these boundaries serve not to exclude people, but to entice people, to make people feel that what's behind that, who has not felt the desire to move a curtain to one side and see what's on the other side? It's the boundary that gives you that desire, that gives you that feeling of being drawn in. So this is, um, I chose Laon Cathedral because I'm very fond of it. It's got a really wonderful extent. Also, it's not very greatly visited in the north of France compared to Amiens or Chartres or any of the others. It's also a photograph that I have to find which didn't have very many <coughs> chairs in it. So this is a very important thing. What were these vast cathedrals for? What were these huge spaces for when people didn't sit down because they didn't have their ten chairs? <coughs> so these great cathedrals were planned, as probably many of you know, from the choir outwards. So they built the most important part first. 
the, like the sacred space, the place for the monks to gather and shut the office, which was their duty. That's where they lived, so this was their, you know, their daily job, and where mass could be celebrated. And then the rest of the church would grow, coming towards people, as it were, going westwards. Perhaps fire or other disaster had damaged an earlier structure, and the nave could be reused. The old nave could be reused while the new building began, so this happened in St. Peter's, for example. The essential function, as I mentioned, was the mass in the office, not the housing of the congregation. So we can see there, you can almost imagine no seats at all. So people would come in to the church and they would wander around. All the aisle chapels would be full of monks celebrating mass at what could have been 40 altars down the side of the grass, a great cathedral like this. So at almost any given moment you would wander in and you would hear mass going on at one of these little side altars. Probably not the high altar, but certainly the side altar. So in a sense it's like, um, you can imagine sort of like a, a buzzing factory where all sorts of stuff is going on all the time and you can participate in any way you wish. You can just stay for a few minutes, you can stay for the whole day. There was, there's a lot of freedom when there's no pews put in. So to quote from Martin Moserbach's book, um, The Heresy of Formlessness, man's first religious act was defense around the sacred place. In the old churches, this was done not only with walls that protected it against the outside world, but also by the <coughs> inner arrangement, choir stalls, communion rails, grills, screens, and canastasis in, in the Eastern tradition. These all create a space for the blessed sacrament, the Holy of Holies. It shows faith in God's bodily presence and that is embodied in the architecture. And yes, and then he makes a point about the, the 40 masses, and this is, <coughs> so we can see some other churches of different periods. The, the sacredness of this building, when we translate it to what a Baroque church, like this is a neo-Baroque church here at the oratory, so say the oratory in Rome, we're going to be looking at as well, has a different feel about it, and the function, the function is essentially the same, but depending on the context, the historical, the historical context, the context of the order, for whom the church was built, or whatever, each one of those, um, each one of those aspects of sacredness is slightly altered in order to suit the the connection. <coughs> so we're going to see lots of different aspects of sacredness, but I guess it's for you to judge where where you feel. I mean, everybody has their own particular. It's not just about taste; it's also about where you feel that it is the most sacred for you, but we're going to try and define it a little bit. So this is a church I'm particularly fond of thinking about. It's got magnificent sculpture, which I haven't got time to talk about here, but there's the Pentecost um, sort of magnificent sign by Gisalbertus of Otan. So it's one of the medieval works of art that's it's actually, he wrote his name. So, Essentially, they brought here the relics of St. Mary Magdalene. And so, once you've got relics, you've got pilgrims. Once you've got pilgrims, you've got a huge influx of people, you've got money coming in, you've got an ability, a possibility to rebuild, to decorate, to employ fine artists, and so forth. So, here we have a glance down the church. This is the narthex, this entrance space coming into the church. There's John the Baptist in the middle. He's saying this is the Lamb of God. He's showing it on, the, on his sort of plaque. Uh, the mission to the Gentiles and, uh, is being illustrated in the sculpture. And famously, this was the church where St. Bernard of Clairvaux preached a crusade and where St. Thomas Becket threatened excommunication of Henry II in a Pentecost sermon. So this is, this is a church that's had um, strong, let's say, connections with history. It was a very important church. And the way that it was built is very, <coughs> is, is a very significant one. This photograph was taken on the 24th of June, the feast of St. John the Baptist, who we saw right at the beginning of the church. And on that day, when the sun is at its height, you get this light coming down all the way from the sanctuary at like the end, which is the most perfect act. The symbolism there, which of course 
runs through all of these Gothic cathedrals, of which much of it was written down by Neoplatonist theolo theologians, philosophers um, in the Paris schools and so on. If this idea of um, Christ being the light, and from the light it comes down and sheds light on all of us. And so it's like sharing in that sac sacredness and where does it come from. So here it's perfectly aligned so that on this day, on that feast day, which is also you know, in Summer's Day, there would be this um, extraordinary uh, light coming down. All the way down the nave, the capitals of the columns have got a carved with stories of men and, and you know some fantastic beasts and so on. It's a it's a real it's very very rich in, in sculpture. It's almost like this whole place. The sculpture tells us. The orientation tells us. The relic tells us that this place was built on God's command. And a lot has been written about the meaning there of um, of Vesale. And so I put this uh, quotation which we heard already. So Vesalay now, after having been, you know, through the vicissitudes of the revolution being closed down and then, you know, orders being taken away, it's now um, an order called the Fraternity of Jerusalem. So it looks as if it's people dressed up, but actually this is what they wear, those monks, and there they are um, at office in the sanctuary. And we see here the purity of Cistercian design because under that system there was a, 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 a reformation, a true reformation meaning coming from within, which, um, which asked people to look in a different way about the way that churches should be built and churches should be decorated. So we can see this constantly as a constant cycle um, throughout well, art in general, but also sort of particularly in the sort of trajectory of Christian architecture and Christian art is there's it's a <coughs> periods of uh, growing to become more and more decorative, more um, rich, and then suddenly there's a fall down, and then people think, no, no, we must do it differently. We must be pure. So this is one of the many sort of waves of purity. And so in the Cistercian order, um, Sir Bernard dictated there should be you no know, bells. He was reacting against a huge monastery at Cluny, which the revolution destroyed, the French Revolution destroyed, which was a shame because it must have been the most magnificent, vast church, full of incredible sculpture, towers, belfries, with the snow And so he was kind of reacting against that and saying, you know, Cistercian um, monastery is going to be in very wild places and the architecture is going to be very pure, very simple. And he insisted on this and he wrote about it, he, he wrote the theory of it um, and taught his monks this way. The idea of, again, getting closer and closer to God each time these reforms came by. And then, you know, they tended to diminish in strength, and that's natural, that's just a cycle. There are quite a lot of Cistercian monasteries in this country, which you can see uh, remnants in Yorkshire, particularly at the front of Abbey. Okay, so now from big churches to a very small one, which I'm quite fond of, because I've got a little cottage where I go sometimes, and it's near to UL is a wonderful place in Oxfordshire. This chapel is an extraordinary one. It has the tombs of the grandparents of, um, of Chaucer, and it has the tomb of the Duchess of Suffolk, Alice de Lampole, which is one of the most extraordinary pieces of um, medieval, late medieval um, carving um, on her tomb. And the whole of this chapel, the chapel of St. John the Baptist, was uh, redesigned, let's say, when that, her tomb was made in this tiny little village in many ways, this magnificent parish church. So that kind of shows you a little bit somehow about the importance of that. It was a it had royal connections anyway, that village. But the reason that I'm showing it is because they have put um, in the early 20th century an architect, an arts and crafts architect called Sir Ninian Comper came and he made a restoration of what an idea of what a medieval altar would like complete with curtains, as you can see. So this altar is actually dedicated to St. Sebastian, which is quite interesting, but also doesn't fit with the chapel, which is essentially meant to be John Baptist. But there's St. Sebastian on the front. Um, and there's this little altar, all beautifully done in, in, in neo-Gothic, um, with, with the curtains. Now, I started thinking then about curtains and what, the, what these curtains mean. Well, of course, they are, again, the boundary. They are about the private, the sacred. 
we're familiar when we go to Mass, we see the priest opens the, the tabernacle with the key, and then if you're lucky enough to see, there's a little curtain. So the curtain again is another layer. And this comes, well, we'll see where it comes from. So this, I, I've just got this off the internet, I have no idea if that person knows where it is, tell me. Um, a similar restored medieval. Oh, yeah. It's a Okay, thank you. So another restored medieval altar or revived medieval altar with a priest saying the Mass. So this is how, let's say, the UL church would have been used had that been an original altar. The idea of protection is also very, very important. So I'm going to show you some of the, let's say, the evidence of where, where this idea of curtains comes from. So this is from Ravenna, the, the Santa Polinaria Nuova, one of the many churches in Ravenna, um, in Italy, at the time of when it was the capital of the, of the Eastern Empire, well, Eastern and Western Empire. The Palace of Theodoric, and it's written there, Palatium, to show you what it is. And there's that palace with the arches and the curtains hanging in Eastern fashion between the arches. So this was adopted very much into <coughs> the interior of churches in the Byzantine Byzantine Rite, particularly in Ravenna. So this is a famous mosaic of the Empress Theodora assisting at Mass. Um, there's a matching one, this is in uh, San Vitale. There's a matching one on the other side of the apse with her husband, Justinian, he's uh, standing next to his very clerics, archbishops, and so forth, and um, he's offering the bread, she's offering the wine. So there they are on either side of the altar, participating in creating this sacred space. But I put the illustration in specifically to show you that in order for her to enter into the church, this palace curtain then becomes a liturgical curtain. It becomes a place that of protecting of the, of the sacred space from somebody even as um, <coughs> as elevated as the um, as the empress herself. And oh yeah, I'll just yeah. There's a couple of things that um, Martin Mezebach has to say about this curtain business. The when the um, when the great oriental kings presented themselves, they were always behind a curtain. The curtain would then be drawn back, and this happened in, in, in the court of Justinian and, and Theodore as well. And then there was the imperial epiphany. So essentially, the epiphany meaning the appearance. The curtain was drawn back, the emperor and the empress was then visible, and everybody would fall to their knees in uh, devotion, respect, whatever. So this kind of relationship of um, the boundary being withdrawn, then the sacred is, in a sense, the king, the emperor, sacredness, is being exposed to, to the public, and then we can adore. And so we take a lot of this dialogue between um, private and um, public uh, from that world into ours. And this is a wonderful picture in the National Gallery that shows yet another miracle, mass. Um, I'll explain the miracle in a moment. But then there's the curtain, as it were, in use. You see, it's the curtain is being pulled to one side at the moment of the consecration in order to give a glimpse of the moment to uh, the king who's kneeling there. And it seems that the story is that he had one sin that he couldn't confess, he just couldn't do it. So um, an angel helpfully put it on a piece of paper and, um, and dropped it down. Um, so then that was fine, because then he, you know, then he got his pardon. It's, it's meant to be Charles Martel, it's supposed to have taken place in Orléans in 719. This picture is generally loved by art historians because it shows the interior of Saint-Denis in Paris at a particular moment, around 1500. That's what it looked like. So when we see a picture like this, we can see evidence of the use of the, these curtains inside. Protection, um, stopping the candles from blowing out. You know, there's practical aspects to, to all of this, to all of these, these, um, these containments, let's say. So we move a bit now into
into um, the 16th century, sort of high Renaissance Rome. And this picture depicts another miracle. Um, Pope St. Gregory saying Mass, and the, um, the Man of Sorrows on the cross appears in front of him. Um, again, at, particularly at this time in history, the constant stressing of the corporeality of Christ in the Eucharistic sacrifice is of key importance because obviously of the Protestant reform or let's say the Protestant revolution which was proposing an alternative. And so the church there was being very um, dogmatic and art stood in the service of the church. So um, the boundaries are blurred both in the period the picture we just saw, there's a king from the 8th century present in Saint Denis Cathedral in, this, in the beginning of the yeah, 1500s, the edge of the 16th century. Here we've got a, an early Christian pope present in essentially a Renaissance building in St. Peter's, as it looks like. So there's a kind of blurring between the past and the present, between legend, history, the magical context of the miraculous powers of the mass. And in both the one we've just seen and this one, although they're very different in feeling, we're very close. The painter has brought us extremely close to this miracle, extremely, we're <coughs> at a privileged viewpoint. We're right up close, right up close to the altar. There's always you know, there's, there's a separation. Usually, those who are attending the priest at mass form like a cordon around it to keep to keep everything to keep us out as the viewers. But we are allowed to see the curtains drawn back, the lights, the candles are lit, the miracle is there for us to witness, and the painting reinforces that. This picture is really interesting as well because all of these people are real people, sort of portrayed by Suki. Um, Cardinal Farnese, who was, who, um, met, sorry, Medici, who paid for the picture, is in the foreground. Note, of course, the essential presence of a canopy over. So we've been talking about boundaries being like this, you know, around the space to make it safe. We also have to have a boundary over there. That's very important. That's particularly important when the Blessed Sacrament is exposed. So it's like, um, I don't know, I can only think of you know, a really banal example, like you know, a newborn baby. You don't take the newborn baby out without putting something over its head. You know, you just, the head is the symbol of the most important thing. Therefore, things have to be covered, the head should be covered. Therefore, a covering from above is just as important as the covering from underneath <coughs> to create this atmosphere of sacredness. And I am indebted to my friend Mrs. Schenkman for having taken this beautiful photograph of the oratory in Rome, showing just what the problem is when you don't have those uh, boundaries and you don't have those um, you don't have those things that cover and things that protect. Because essentially, um, as everybody knows, at a certain point in the 20th century, uh, it was deemed necessary to bring altars out into the nave. So thereby changing this approach business that we've been talking about, that you, know, you go from one layer to another layer and you gradually get closer and closer to the sacred. Well, changing that by bringing that into the middle. So here, but because this building in Rome is so important artistically, the Roman um, superintendent, superintendency of uh, fine arts will not permit any changes. So. It's simply an addition takes place. So there's a, there's a little altar is brought forward, not in itself a, a horrible object. And, and yet it's put on a sort of, I can only describe it as a catwalk, really, covered in carpet. And it's right there. And in order to stop people going and walking all over it, they've had to put um, like a boundary around. Now you see, that, that wouldn't have been necessary had the altar stayed behind because it reads like a special place. It, it has that distance, 
to protect it. Now, I was at Mass there a while ago, and the priest was complaining, not complaining about where the altar was, but he was saying the way that people behave in this church is scandalous. He had witnessed somebody come up, um, because the ceiling is, is frescoed by Pietro da Cortona, it's a magnificent ceiling. And so they had um, crossed over the, the rope and laid their phone, camera phone, on the <coughs> altar in order to be able to take a picture of the ceiling because it's a really good view. But you see, there was no, there, there simply was no, I mean, okay, there were no altars, but let's say it was not during an, the adoration of the first sacrament. There were no candles lit on the altar. There was nothing happening on the altar. This person was not able to read from the architecture that it was sacred, and so just went up and was just like, oh, well, there's a table. I mean, you know, so, so he was lamenting that. But in a sense, that's, well, it's a bit too late, really, because these, these altars uh, abound everywhere, and they cause, they cause um, unease, but they also cause confusion. And so in a sense, you know, having the Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament under the, under the dome, okay, that's maybe that it reads okay, it doesn't read badly in terms of sacredness, in terms of um, um, distance, but it would do much better if it were in its designated <coughs> place up against up against the uh, high altar. Okay, so moving into the, well, I guess we're in the Baroque now. This is the, the Jesu, and um, essentially the side parts of the church have, have, have drawn in, and it becomes one massive hall with these big Baroque churches, such as the one next door. Everything's visible, everything's open, brilliant, luxury decoration, and here, this is a side altar. This is the altar of St. Ignatius. And it's a tomb. It's his tomb. And he's the founder of the order of the, of the Jesuits, so he's very important. So the relic, the tomb, is present, but it is not so much the point as it would be in the, in the medieval church. There's no kind of place to go and touch and so forth. It's the image of the saints that becomes the focus of the cult as are the words and deeds of these new orders, the oratorians and Jesuits and so on. And the enthusiasm with which the Jesuits, um, just after the death of St. Ignatius, uh, embraced the notion of him being a saint and sort of prematurely sanctified him, uh, drew lots of criticism from um, the Pope at the time of this obviously takes a process in order to become a saint. Now, the designer of this um, altar is Andrea Pozzo, who was a Jesuit priest, who was a mathematician, architect, brilliant designer, designer in many ways. So, as I said, the image is the, is the focus of this. And so, sorry, there's a reflection on there, but there's a, you can see a canvas with the painting of St. Ignatius on. And so, this happens like at five o'clock, a bit like Fortnum's clock or something. Um, the, the panel slides down. So as you can see, it's halfway down, and then all the way down to reveal the statue of the saint. And inside this extraordinarily rich jewel box setting, and the saint is declaiming, so he's alive, he's using his words, it's very dramatic, it's very theatrical. The whole, the whole structure of it is theatrical the sliding down screen and so forth. And the inside of the, um, of the area, the apse in which the statue of the saint is the largest panels of lapis lazuli, so they say, yeah, in existence. Uh, so no expense spared for the glory of this moment. This painting shut sliding away to reveal it is essentially the perfect example of what's known as the affect in Baroque art. Extending the drama of the mass to the congregation and to the spectators. Okay, so 1696 in Rome. This church in um, Asendalt in Holland <coughs> probably looked a bit like the Jesu um, before the revolution took place that removed all the art from the inside of it. So this is a painting made in 1649, so it's a painting, I'm it's a painting of the interior of that church in the mid-17th century. And notice how the focus has completely changed. 
so that the pulpit, which as in these big long churches, the pulpit is halfway down the church, or a third of the way down the church, a large object, usually on the left hand side, just as it is here, um, and it's there in order to be within the people. The pulpit as now, in the Reformed liturgy, in the Protestant liturgy, the pulpit is the focus. It is not the altar, it is not what had been commonly known as the sacred space, that is to one side, that is no longer the focus, and so even the fact that the artist who must have taken this picture was probably standing where the high altar would be in order to look down the church and to see um, the scene that he that he showed here. The presence of high pews, was because the sermon was very long, so people had to sit down at this point, and um, the, the whole um, architecture of the church in a sense is being misread, it's being, it's being Adopted, adapted to its new function, doesn't fit particularly well. But let's jump forward to 2013. I'm sorry, it's completely whited out at the back, but imagine there's an apse there with um, three windows at the top, three windows below. This is a church that um, was damaged and completely rebuilt in 2013. It's a, it's a church from the Baroque period, and John Pawson is a very famous. English um, architect um, who concentrates his his practice on on this idea of minimalism, and so he's created essentially a completely stripped back, taken the structure, and maintained one or two such as you can see objects of um, beauty uh, from the original structure, and he's placed them against this backdrop. And I think it works it works very well. But what worries me particularly is this idea of the sacred space. What's happened to all of those boundaries, all of those signifiers that told you you were getting close to something that was very sacred? Well, he's got very beautiful materials. He uses really great materials that so you can't fault him. So you've got lovely marble and, and so forth here. But everything is slightly scattered. You've got a couple of steps. Things are gathered on the steps there. Um, there's a certain amount of symmetry. But everything is a little bit lost on that space. It's a bit like a plane and we put a one or two, three, and we see this a lot, and we'll see some more examples of the same thing. It's an area rather than um, a distinct, discrete place, and the relationship between the elements is not clear. And we don't see the tabernacle um, any longer. So I think this is, you know, it's a fair example. So this one, I found it, and kind of made me sort of, it stunned me with just how awful <laughs> it really is. When you think of the mad lighting, look at that insane lighting, and um, well, I don't know what it says, really. Um, it says, listen. It says, listen to the person behind the microphone. It says that, um, but it doesn't really say anything. But then, of course, it's serving a different purpose. It's serving a different sort of congregation. It's serving a, it's serving a um, <coughs> completely different aesthetic. However, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of thought has gone into this. Um, it's not by accident that it ended up this way. Now, I want to make a tiny diversion before I finish on onto the subject of um, centrally planned churches, because if one's thinking of the idea of sacredness and boundaries and focus. The idea of a circle, the center, this seems very appealing, and it certainly is very appealing to a lot of people who design churches. Now, the idea of being around, everybody gathered around this one thing. So, where does this come from, this idea of a centrally planned church? Well, heavily, but either in relationship to um, the orders, the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre, because it was based on the uh, reminder of the temple, the Dome of the Rock, converted into, into a church, the Holy Sepulchre, a Jerusalem focused um, church design. But it was influential in the Renaissance to have this central focus. Bramante's plan for St. Peter's originally was that. And, and here's one church in, in Tuscany which is a central, I should have perhaps shown the exterior of it, but here is the interior of San Biagio, and it's 
four equal transepts round a central place. But the altar is not in the middle, it's in one of the apses. So you come in and there's still a place to kind of move towards. It's not where you come in and you're kind of not sure which side to turn on because it's actually sort of happening in the middle. That's, as I say, a very rare thing. Should it not be taken too lightly, but lots of architects have grasped this idea and run with it. Um, particularly guilty is this one, which reminds me of nothing so much as a kind of dance floor, but it's got lots of seats on it, so you can't even dance. So it doesn't seem to work. And um, of course, when it was built, it was much mocked. It has many, many flaws architecturally, in terms of engineering terms and so on. But that's not what I'm concerned with. I'm just concerned with trying to find where the, where the defined place for sacred um, can exist within something of this sort. However, Contemporary architecture can produce some magnificent solutions to this idea of the sacred. Um, verticality, well, you couldn't get more vertical than the Holy Family in Barcelona, which is just this towering, extraordinary um, structure. And as you enter it, your eyes go all over the place. There's so much color, there's so many, there's so many different things to look at. It's a little bit confusing and it's also very noisy because they're building it. Um, but when you get into the central aisle, you have, you're, there's no mistaking where the sacred place is because it's on a huge cliff with many, many um, steps leading up. And so we see it there, very steep. The high altar's there and there's that very important hat over the altar, the protection from above. Um, and the crucifix. It's a very bold statement. To me, it's got a sort of it's got this sort of simplicity of, of design, but with a lot of the declamatory drama of the Baroque is built into it. And obviously, the baldacchino, you know, the thing on the top, it has its sort of origins in this um, of at St. Peter's. Um, what uh, Bernini was doing here. Gaudi was clearly looking at um, at Bernini. There's tradition and innovation in harmony and the centralizing focus that Bernini is, make, is making here is to the back wall of the church where is the Cathedral of Petri. So even though he's creating um, a focus on the tomb of the apostle and the altar where the Pope says the mass and so on, there's also leading on and through. And um, Gaudi in the Sagrada Familia is doing the same, using the same language helping us to understand it as we approach the sacred, but then there's even more. There's God, it's God himself, as it were, in the um, image of the, the Holy Spirit on the back wall in St. Peter's. And I wanted to include this because I know well, people always say that Pope Francis doesn't say Mass kind of the right way around, and this, but he did this year, right at the beginning. And when Michelangelo painted the last judgment in the, in the Sistine Chapel wall, it was specific, that chapel is for the Pope, as you know, and it's specifically an altarpiece. Now we know the tradition of Christian altarpieces is that they're there, so that when the sacrifice of the Mass happens, the offering is made to the sacred image, depicted in um, usually the painting, but sometimes in the sculpture that's there. So in a sense, by, by having Mass at this altar, and then offering at the consecration to Christ in last judgment above, I think this probably couldn't be a finer relationship between liturgy and art, and wonderful to see that it is being used in that way. So, a Baroque church in Florence, um, San Michele, Gaetano. Here the altars come forward, but the choir is behind. You can't see it, it's in darkness. That's where the monks would sit, or the canons in this case. There's for a focus. So the altar is forward, but height and light are um, maintained. The liturgical action is concentrated. 
by this uh, big structure behind it, and our attention is also concentrated. And here's the um, oratory in Oxford uh, by Joseph Hansen from 1874. He'd been a collaborator with Pugin earlier on. And it's been restored. Um, I took this photo the other day. Um, the old screen brought forward. But there's still very much the sense of kind of one layer of another layer um, and being embraced by this lovely Riridos with all the saints put in. Father Lang makes a point which um, Cardinal Newman, being critical of Pugin and his Gothic revival, say, Cardinal Newman said, uninterrupted tradition of Gothic architecture from the time it was introduced to the present day, there is, that did not exist. Mr. Pugin was notoriously engaged in a revival. So the revival of it meant essentially blocking off all the developments otherwise, and therefore a purification to the extent of one father, Michael Lang, in his book, then leads this straight to the Corbusier. In a sense, there's a, there's a very clear um, trajectory from that. Now, this is another church I visited recently, enormously disappointing what could have been, when William Wardell made it, a fine sort of Gothic revival building of its type, there's really nothing left. I mean, there's carpet, there's a sort of catwalk thing at the front. There's no rails. There's a wooden chest with strange symbols. There's no cross. The tabernacle is kind of like the church traditionally is the sanctuary. You know, that old story that <coughs> in order to escape the, the king's law, you know, a robber or whatever, a thief could go and claim a sanctuary in the church because the church's law was, was different. And, so, but where would you feel safe here? No, you wouldn't. You just, you feel unsafe and the Blessed Sacrament feels abandoned. Okay, so who's responsible for this sort of thing? Well, this is um, Ronchon Church before it fell down. And then this is how um, Le Corbusier made it um, in um, 1954. And of course, he's the, the father of modernism in architecture and, and on the subject of his, of his influence in, in terms of um, secular architecture, in terms of you know, making places for people to live, I, I cannot speak at this moment. But here, he's making a very dramatic statement, this church on top of a hill. Notice, though, that this is not meant to be a parish church. This is for some nuns. And it's like a little pilgrimage <coughs> place for the local people, very rural. In a sense, there's a sort of freedom. You know, his idea of what's fun what architectural function of churches are, it was kind of, must have been in the back of his mind. The exterior has one thing to say, okay, which, you know, it's not so, not so difficult to appreciate. The interior is so blatantly confusing. This is where, this is where it seems to me that, um, Having walked away from this idea of boundaries and the things that go with it that we're so familiar with in all of the things I've shown you, like particularly symmetry, once you get past that, then you get to a confusion. Um, the sanctuary does retain some sort of sense of boundary, perhaps just because somebody's put a, you know, like a, a, a pew in front. But I find that when you look at that, the most dominating feature is the stairway on the left leading out to the roof. This is more dominating than the altar or the candle or the crucifix or, or so on. It's, it's almost as if you know people are on their way out of the building that way, but meanwhile, mass is taking place <coughs> on the right hand side. <coughs> it's got, you know, and a lot of these are architects who also, you know, as well. You know, once they've got plenty of money, then the um, materials are really fine, and there's a lot to appreciate um, in their use. But I think that this concept of the boundary having been abandoned. <coughs> okay, so this is what the Cathedral of Los Angeles used to look like. A fine example of the Italian Baroque revival and. The Pope of the period sent um, a relic of Saint Viviana. Um, 
It was damaged in an earthquake in 1994, and the Archdiocese decided to pull it down, but it was illegal, actually, because um, anyway, they were prevented, and a deal was done with the city of Los Angeles to provide a new space for a new cathedral, which was then built. This still exists, but it is now a post-Emmy Awards party venue. Um, its replacement as a church is an object lesson in in vanity, essentially, how modern forms and a pared down aesthetic, which is so often praised, do not necessarily imply a pared down budget. And I have some figures, which is like, um, each one of those lamps was $150,000. This is the sanctuary. As you can see, this photograph has got people, I don't know what they're doing, setting up for something, possibly cleaning or maintaining the building some way. All of these these parts, which, this part, this part, this part, this part, they're all kind of scattered in this in this air, this sort of area which is lost, completely lost. The, 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 the feeling is, well, I guess sort of panic. But of course when you come in, there's there's a lot of light and people like that. But too much light, without focus, without <coughs> darkness to go with it destroys the meaning. It's an alien space in many senses. There's complete fragmentation of the sanctuary and its contents. Um, yeah. We feel lost and God feels irrelevant. Some more success is had in, in littler ways. This is a, um, in Chile and it's a, a chapel belonging to a convent out in the mountains. It is cohesive, there's strong design held together by use of materials and it's enhanced by height from the ground sort of upwards. It's a contemplative space, just another view there. But in my, in my opinion, it's still too horizontal. On the other hand, we have something which I feel succeeds much less well. It's, it's the same idea, this sort of horizontal spread out sanctuary. It's got some height in there, but everything, rather like the, in the center of the cathedral in Los Angeles, everything is so fragmented. What would tie this together? And again, the sort of access being provided down the sides and almost round the back is slightly worrisome. We're not quite sure of the liturgical drama being enacted <coughs> depends on direction, as we saw with, with the statue of so statue of, of St. Ignatius. It has to be seen in a particular way. Here, it's unsuccessful. This one, I like a lot more because it's, it's, there's a very strong connection with tradition of wooden churches in Poland. Um, it's using nature as the altarpiece. And were the priest to, instead of facing people, which he probably does, were he in fact to face with the people towards the back, then there would be a very beautiful enhancement of the meaning of, um, of the Mass and offering to God in nature. And so okay, my final example is, I find this a fascinating um, Building. So there was this person called Brother Klaus, Brother Klaus, and he uh, was a hermit essentially. And they built this chapel to honor his memory. It was, I don't know, 16th century, I think. Um, very recently, in the field, right in the middle of nature. And it's this sort of concrete tower, it has no roof. It narrows as it gets in. There's lots of photographs. You should look it up if you're interested in seeing how it, how it such a thing. Can be made. It has no door. It has an opening. So it's very much like that cave, you know, that we were almost like some St. Francis little cave. And there's the interior. You can see the, um, the rough treatment of the, of the concrete has been left completely bare. There's a little uh, bronze bust of the Holy Man and a place for candles. There is no altar. It's not a, a, a chapel of the same mass. It's a chapel for going and thinking and contemplating. So perhaps in this, we can see some germ of where 
success can be had in the modern idiom with this idea of the sacred and the space. Perhaps restricting rather than having everything wide open is going to be more helpful. Okay, so in terms of violating the sacred space, we've seen quite a lot of violations, but this is the ultimate violation, isn't it? Um, of that sanctuary where this appalling murder took place um, inside the sanctuary of uh, Canterbury Cathedral. But the great martyr was made, history was shifted as a result, and perhaps the real and lasting violation of that sanctuary didn't take place then, but afterwards when the shrine was dismantled and, and Henry VIII took everything away to keep. And so, final image, we're back to this kind of idea of simplicity and how does the sacred. The sacred space should be built, but most notably and essentially should be built in the minds and the hearts of those who come together to worship, as can be seen here in the line of men creating a space in front of the improvised altar on the jeep at Omaha Beach. And you can see they're all lined up, but isn't anybody telling them how to line up, they're just lining up because that's what we do in the right place for the right moment. But ultimately this work is not the work of architects, but is for the Holy Spirit and for the church. Thank you very much.